Thanks again for joining the Sales versus Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Scott, and today I'm going to be sitting down with Casey Hill, who is uh, the growth manager at Bonduro. Um, Casey has a really, really impressive background in, in all things SaaS. Um, so he has moved from uh, individual contributor to sales director in under four years at a previous company, Entreport. Uh, he has received a print uh, recognition in the Entrepreneur Magazine as a rising star uh, and has uh, been the recipient of a rising star scholarship to Saster in 2020. Uh, he's a top 10 writer on Quora for SaaS marketing, SaaS sales, SaaS startups, and just SaaS in general. Uh, he has founded his own company, a, a tabletop card game, which was 800% funded on Kickstarter. So he is a, an entrepreneur at heart. Uh, he sold thousands of copies of his own game uh, globally. Um, he's been working with all sizes of business from mom and pop shops to, uh, to brand, household brand names such as BMW, uh, L'Oreal. He runs his own blog on the side. Um, he manages a ton of different marketing campaigns, both in and external to his company for SaaS products. Um, and he's really just been uh, overall a, a contributor and an expert on all things SaaS, sales, marketing. He's been featured in over 100 and has written as well for over 100 publications, including Associated Press, uh, Citibank, Entrepreneur, Business Insider, uh, Forbes, and Databox. And uh, he's like, I'm very excited to speak. With Casey because he's speaking about um, he's speaking about obviously marketing and sales and SaaS, but he's speaking about more importantly uh, video. And I'm a big fan of video. I put out a lot of video on my own social, and whenever I've worked in organizations, I've always found that video is one of the most powerful tools uh, to sell, to prospect, to engage, and to really connect um, in a digital era where uh, I think a lot of a lot of people rely heavily on email, and uh, they, we lose unfortunately that personal connection. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to let uh, Casey uh, reintroduce himself and his company, and then we're, we're going to go from there. <laughs> awesome. Scott, thanks so much for having me on. I'm, I'm excited to chat about video and, and kind of the changing landscape um, in both marketing and sales and some of the trends that uh, we see happening in 2020. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, awesome. the, the company Bonjoro, um, just as like a really quick note for what that is, is basically a personalized video messaging platform. And to give kind of an example to make this kind of clear how it might work, say someone comes onto your website as a business owner and they either book a demo or they fill out your inquiry form, right? For most businesses, what might happen is they might get like an email notification or that person might be brought into their database or their CRM system, right? Um, but what we do is we'll actually be able to, we have an app on the phone. It'll actually send that request directly to your phone. And so I'll get a request that says, hey, Scott um, wrote in an inquiry. This is what he said. This is his role. This is his background. And right there in real time, I can basically flip on that recorder and I can respond um, and build that initial human connection with that person. Um, and, it's, and it's tied in and works with your existing tech stack, which you know, that's one of the really important things for us. We see um, you know, there's a lot of video tools out there, but we think one of the things that's really unique about Bonjoro is that we're working directly in with the person's email tool, website form, CRM. So it really kind of goes with the flow of what we think modern businesses and modern businesses, you're on the fly. You oftentimes are working from your phone, you're out in the field, you're meeting with clients. And so we're really trying to make that as turnkey as possible. So, so that's Bonjoro in a quick nutshell. So there's so many, um, there's so many, really strong points as to why that could be effective because outside of just like the, the instantaneousness of the, in, of the interaction, um, I personally, I, I, I respond better to sales reps who uh, call me right away. Uh, if I submit a lead and they're calling me within five minutes, for me, that feels like they really care. So this is taking it a step further than that. And you're having that live face-to-face -face interaction almost instantly the second somebody shows interest. So that's, that's a really, really strong, it's a really strong play. And obviously, like you mentioned, the integration is key because um, for any, any tech or SaaS or whatever company to, to really work, that's to work with the sales reps, lifestyle, the company, the customer, all that sort of has to be congruent. But I'll get into, I'll get into more about uh, Manjaro video and all that. I want to first sort of introduce yourself a little bit more. Like what's your origin story? Where did you come from? What's your background? How did you end up here? You have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, you, you, you're obviously um, a well-rounded person in terms of SaaS and understanding how, uh, how to best market and sell it. 
Um, but you're also a, a, like an entrepreneur at heart. So tell me sort of your career progression and how you came to uh, Bonjoro. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my name is Casey Hill. I'm 29. Um, I've kind of grown up my entire life in California. Um, so was raised here, went to school in California, went to college in California. Um, I come from kind of a, a long lineage of, of entrepreneurs. So um, my dad has run multiple businesses. My grandpa ran a business. My cousin runs a business. And so from a young age, I was definitely encouraged to take risks, to go out there and just test stuff out. Um, and, and to kind of iterate. And also it's, it's interesting reflecting back now, you know, throughout the course of my life now I've worked with thousands of businesses. So I now have a lot of a broader perspective of entrepreneurship and, and, and business. And what I find is interesting is that, um, you know, the more that I've kind of delved into, um, SaaS and, and software companies and and, and founders and their stories, I found that there's this very high, I mean, the best way to maybe say it is intensity. People are very um, push, push, go. And it's, it's interesting when I reflect back on my own experience, because I think it was really impactful on me that, um, you know, when I grew up, my dad ran an electronic packaging company that was essentially, so like circuit boards and such. And he was super successful, but it was a small business. You know, he had 10 to 15 employees, he was back every day by five o'clock and hanging out with our family. And it was very balanced, which I, you know, kind of took for granted when I was younger. And now as I get older, I realize that that's not the norm, right? Uh, I think being more unbalanced is typically what you see more commonly. So I think I've come to really appreciate um, how you kind of have to make a conscious choice in entrepreneurship to create the lifestyle that you want to create. Um, and because there's no clocking out time like there is, right, and in a standard nine to five job, you are responsible for kind of creating that balance. So I, I bring up that story just because it was something that I think was really impactful in kind of how I view entrepreneurship um, and kind of how I view that whole thing. But, um, but yeah, so, so I kind of grew up and I was testing ideas. And my first kind of real, I guess, quote unquote, foray into entrepreneurship is I was in college. Um, and I was actually buying and selling trading cards, um, just as a way to kind of offset some of my tuition costs. The side, the side hustle just, is real, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's total yeah. side hustle. And I decided, I said, you know what, I'm going to write, I'd figured out how to get connected with wholesalers. And I said, this information might be valuable to people. So I'm going to write an e-guide about how to do it. And so I wrote a five page PDF that I wrote over the course of one night and suddenly that went on to start. I, I literally was selling hundreds and hundreds of copies. I started at 99 cents. I took it to $15. I was still selling. I mean, I was making thousands and thousands of dollars from sending someone a five page PDF. And, and that kind of opened my eyes. I said, wow, like there's a lot of interesting opportunities in the modern economy. Things that, you know, in my parents' generation, they're just kind of like, you know, whoa, they didn't even know that was a thing. Um, and so I think that was a really interesting first experience to kind of get my feet wet. Um, and then at that same time, when I was going to school up in Berkeley, UC Berkeley, where I went to college, I also started to intern at technology companies, um, many of which have, you know, Tech Validate was one of my first companies that then got acquired um, by SurveyMonkey, which is, is a pretty well-known name. Um, but that really got me interested in this idea of scale. You know, one of the reasons why I really like software is this concept that we can influence a lot of people on a global level um, with relatively small teams <laughs> sometimes, right? Yeah. And so that's where I think I really got that side of my interest. You know, I have kind of my entrepreneurial side and then there's this other component which has always been really interested in technology and, and kind of scalable and also what's new and what's coming next. And so, um, you know, that's a, that's a little bit of a background around kind of uh, some of the, the history. Why you're crazy enough to work in a startup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, because you mentioned, uh, you mentioned, like, you know, you do a couple of things because when we first started chatting before the start, I asked, like, what is a what does a growth manager do? And in a startup, like, I, I'm well aware it's like a lot. It's like it's sales, it's marketing, it's it's customer success. It's there's a variety of different departments that you probably fill those shoes with. So it's a great experience, but it's also like, you know, I think the um, the experience that you had with your with your father, like being able to sort of manage his lifestyle properly. I think that you have to take that experience when even if you're not a founder CEO, I think you still have to be very careful because when there's always something to do, and you may be like that bottleneck to do it, 
um, it's very easy to be connected and work, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12 plus hours a day. Uh, and, and that can be harmful, uh, uh-huh. long term. A hundred percent. And and I totally agree with that. And I also think that's one of the reasons too, why I'm a huge proponent of, I think like passion is super important. So, you know, one of the things that you noted at the top of the show was that I launched a tabletop gaming business. And I did that while I was also working full time. And people were like, you know, how did you get that off the ground while still working full time? And I think that the reason that was possible, even though it was a ton of hours, is because I really enjoyed you know, the art direction. I really enjoyed doing the demos and going to these stores and meeting, the, you know, fans and customers face to face. I enjoyed getting out and talking about that product. And so in a way it was work and I was learning a ton about shipping and fulfillment and logistics and all of these crucial, you know, business skills, but it was also something that I really enjoyed and I look forward to. And so I think that's also something that's super critical is the more that you're connected to the type of work you're doing, that also makes it so that, you know, I had the ability to work on stuff that um, wasn't quite as, I guess maybe the right word is like, you know, draining or exhausting because of that personal connection to it. No, that makes sense. And I think that's important um, to, to really get behind what you're passionate about because then it doesn't really feel like work. Um, and it, it's not, it's not, like it's not going to, it's not going to wear you down to the same extent. Right? Um, right. So what are you doing? What are you doing at uh, Banjuro right now? Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm doing, I'm doing growth. And as you said, that kind of encompasses a handful of things. So at the top of the funnel, it's a lot of outreach exposure. So whether that's um, PPC, so like paid campaigns, Facebook, whether that's community curation on social. So, you know, basically designing the graphics and getting the team together to put out, um, you know, messaging on our social channels. Um, whether that's getting connected in with journalist outlets um, and and getting basically people's attention on like, here's this thing. Um, So the earned media side is something I definitely do. Um, And then also one of my favorite things I do is, is actual writing of content itself. Um, I love to write content pieces. And so I do a lot of, you know, guest collaborations on other people's blogs. I write a lot for our blog. I write for our social channels. Um, I think storytelling is something that really it means a lot to me. And I think one of the reasons why I've kind of narrowed in, especially on marketing, I still really like both sales and marketing for different reasons. But one of the reasons why I've accentuated more in on marketing is because I just love that storytelling component. Um, and, and that really kind of aligned with what I was able to do with Bonjoro um, as a startup. So um, that's kind of some of the work I'm doing for that team right now. No, that makes um, that makes a lot of sense, and I think that uh, that your awareness that you have to be able to tell a story uh, when you don't have when you don't have that brand, that years old brand behind you, and you you are a startup. That's very important because you're connecting the dots for the customers. You're helping them understand what value you bring to the table. And of course, every company should be doing this anyways. But I mean, when you call them, you're not a logo they recognize. So the importance right. of a story is is that much more. Um, but, uh, so that's very good. So tell me more about Bonjuro. What, uh, what's the story of the actual company? Where did this, uh, the genesis of the idea, the founders, that kind of thing? Yeah, hundred percent. So we're a new company founded in 2017, um, kind of came onto the stage and the way it was founded is pretty interesting. So our founder actually ran another company, a video survey company called Verbate. And with that company, essentially the idea was you send out, you know, survey questions and people were actually recording responses to those. Um, And a really interesting and I think kind of unique business kind of on the market. But with that, that video technology, sometimes we would use that video technology just to send personal videos out to customers when we were corresponding. And we started getting tons of feedback from um, our verbate customers that were like, we love this. Like if you ever make this into a product, like we will be the first ones in line. Like, we really like the ability to send video and have it be so simple and turnkey. And so then the founder um, kind of started thinking, okay, like I could turn this into a full blown thing. And so that's what we did. We, we created Bonjoro and we built this apparatus to easily send out personal video. Um, And it's kind of been this growing and evolving thing. We've been exploring different niches. Um, Right now we work a lot with marketing agencies, with SaaS software companies, with charities, with sales teams. Um, But I think it's continuing to grow. You know, we're very responsive to our customer base. And so we're continuing to 
kind of like learn from them. And we're also constantly learning new use cases from them, which is awesome. You know, I, I love that, you know, every day, just yesterday, um, I was working with a, a pretty big name charity and they were like, Casey, this would be killer for radio stations. Like you got to get connected into radio stations. And I hadn't even, that hadn't even been on my radar. Like, you know, it's it this whole new thing. So that's why it's really cool to kind of have and be a part of this community that we're building is because you're constantly seeing kind of new applications, um, both in terms of industries, as well as ways that you can uniquely use it to kind of get companies and customers connected in, in kind of a new way, which is kind of at the heart of what we're trying to do with video. And do you find that, um, like what, what, what is the feedback from people that have been using Bunjuro so far? Like, do they, is, do they notice an immediate ROI? Do they notice, like, what, what are they, what are their customers saying about the new, because I don't know anything like this. And I, I don't know any other competitor, to be quite honest, that does anything like this. Maybe you, maybe you do, but I've, I've never seen anything like this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there is a few players in the video space, but like I was kind of mentioning earlier, I think that the integrated component is something that really differentiates and makes kind of Bonjoro stand out. And we've had, um, I mean, amazing feedback, to be frank. I mean, a, a net promoter score, I don't know if, if you've ever talked about it on the show or if you're familiar with that, but you know, we, we're at like a 72 net promoter score, yeah. which I think is, is quite strong. Um, customers are happy. I think that inherently the type of business that it is, um, I think kind of produces a lot of um, customer evangelism around it, but also kind of going specifically to your question of what results are people seeing? Um, I think there's a lot of areas where it can kind of enhance things. So one of the first ways people are using it is to just get more sales conversions. Um, and what I love about the way that we're set up, um, I am a big fan of what I call tangible testing. And so what tangible testing essentially is, is I say, look at right now you say get in a month, you get a hundred inquiries that come in or a hundred book demos or whatever your metric is. Right. And I just tell people, I say, I want you to do half of them the exact way you're doing it right now. Don't change anything. Just keep your process identical. And then for half of them, I want you to send out these videos. I want you to record how long it takes you to send out each of these might be, you know, 45 seconds, minute and a half, you know, on average. So record how long it takes you to send out that personal video and then see how many more conversions come from that. Right. And if at the end of, and we have a trial with our software. And so it's like at the end of the trial, like what are the results? And so what I love is that usually if we can just get people to that point, then it's like it, the conversion rate is incredibly high because it's very, very uh, concrete. It's like, Hey, we converted four more customers and you know, it took us whatever amount of hours, like that was clearly worth it. Awesome. Let's go here. And so, because of the way we're structured and I think because of the way we're allowed to kind of remove that barrier of entry by just letting people say, Hey, try this out. Um, that's awesome. And, and we also use it. I mean, it's, it's used heavily on the conversion phase, but another big part is the retention and kind of like customer delight phase after. So another big place that people are using this is like asking for reviews, right? Like for the average company, when they send out their bulk automated email saying like, please leave us a review how many of those actually convert, you know, for, for a lot of companies, the rates aren't great. Um, so if you can, you know, double, triple 10 X, the amount of people that are leaving reviews, that's another very concrete piece of value that companies can get. So we're, we're kind of using it in a lot of different senses, but, but um, definitely in terms of getting engagement and, and engagement of video overall as a medium, I mean, it, it's dramatically higher um, than standard text email. And, and there's a number of reasons for that. So so one, without going too down the rabbit hole, my, my background is in um, inbound marketing and automated email systems. So I know that field pretty well. Um, one of the hurdles that you can sometimes get into at volume is you start to get things landing in things like the promotions folder in Gmail, right? And mm -hmm. even very yeah. good companies fall into that problem. I mean, it's just that's these ISPs, the inboxes are just very strict. Well, when you're recording a one-off email, you don't have that problem, right? So one-off emails don't land in promotions by the nature of what they are. So what that means is that, you know, those times when people are missing some of your correspondences, you cut that out. And so that's another thing that's going to greatly enhance open rates. And so from a number of angles, it's really helping on that engagement side. That's really, I, I really like the, I really like, um, I really like how it works. That's, uh, are there, are there other competitors that are, are in the space that you sort of benchmark against, or is this really like a blue ocean for, for your company? 
Yeah, I mean, so there definitely is a number of other players in the space. So there's a company called Vidyard. There's a company called BombBomb. Bomb. Those are two other people that are doing personal video. Those are video. similar type, uh, type products. Those are similar. Yeah, they're similar type companies. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we're really focused on is this concept of saying, you know, the more that we can make this turnkey and simple, and the more mm. that we can make it kind of like go in the workflow of the business, the more results we're going to see. Because another thing that's really important to note is that, you know, we work with businesses of all sizes, but our kind of bread and butter is small to mid-sized businesses. And so with small to mid-sized businesses, we realize that, you know, they don't have a lot of time to learn new stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. so it can have, it can have all the features in the world, but if it's not simple, it doesn't matter. So, so that's a huge focus of where we're at as a company is how do we make this just as easy and as seamless for people to pick up as we can. And so I think that's why we're so focused on integration. That's why we're so focused on the mobile application so that it's really, you know, going with you. And when someone, you know, responds back, you can get that notification directly to your phone and having it kind can of you, travel as you go. Can you, can you, um, cause I know you mentioned it briefly, but I really want to lay it out. Can you walk us through like the interaction from a customer landing, like, like step-by-step step, how, how they would actually land on the page, submit a lead, and then what the actual yeah. sales rep yeah. would do. Just one more time. I just want to make sure that I, I yeah. think I understand it because I've used Vidyard before. I've tried it out. Um, and I, I don't think there's any mobile application from what I'm aware of. I think you're just recording video and then right. you're using it as part of your email sequence. So I kind of want to know and differentiate like what you do. You mentioned integrations and, and user experience and whatnot. So go, go through yeah, that. Yeah, 100%. So, so let's say as an example, let's say that you use uh, a CRM, like maybe you use HubSpot or something like that, right? As your backend and on your website, you have a form and on that form, someone can book a call with you, book like a, let's say book a, a demonstration. And so they fill that out. And when they fill that out, they maybe give you a couple pieces of information behind it. So besides giving you their name, they maybe tell you their industry. They maybe tell you one of their chief pain points or what they're trying to do. And then they hit submit on that form. So what's going to happen is that person gets pulled into your database system, HubSpot or whatever else. And what also happens is you have a Bonjoro app. On that Bonjoro app, it's automatically, through our integration with that other system, it's automatically going to pop up and it's going to say, hey, you have a video to record for you know, Scott again as an example. But what it's also doing, and this is a really important part, is it's also bringing that data that you have from the CRM to have it right in front of you. So I not only know that Scott, but I know it's Scott that's from this industry that has this specific problem that's looking to do this. So the idea is that it's not a situation where you're having to go, okay, I got this new inquiry. Now I'm going to log into my CRM. Now I'm going to check this record. Now I'm going to get the data. It's like, no, it's right there in front of you. So I can glance down. I can look at that and then click record and say, hey, um, we work with a lot of video production companies. It's so awesome that you, you know, wrote into us. Um, based on what you're trying to do, normally what we see people doing is X, Y, Z. That's what we're actually going to be covering on the demonstration. Just wanted to reach out and say, hey, um, I'm really looking forward to this. And so that's kind of this, this shift in, in the interaction. And I think one of the things that is really powerful with that um, is kind of the trust element. So one of the things I love about video, and this is something that text can't deliver, is that video has you know, voice inflection. It has tone. It has body language. It has all of these things that produce a different type of connection with the person. And, and so I think that's one of the areas that, that I love about it. And then I think really helps these sales teams because as we all know, anyone who's been in sales, trust is huge. It's, it's like your most, you know, coveted yeah, it's, thing. It's pretty so, much the most important thing in sales. If you don't have trust, you don't sell. So exactly, exactly. So anything that we can do to help accelerate that, I think is phenomenal. And, and one of the things I also really appreciate about personal video is that it makes it really easy to, you know, I always tell people, you don't need any special pedigree or any special background um, to excel with personal video because it's all about you just being authentic and you building that familiarity and similarity with people. Um, and so that's, I think, the kind of cool, unique thing about it is you don't have to have some sort of more developed setup that you might need in standard video with this. It's all about like you just getting your personality across in that instance. So I really appreciate that. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, reasons why people don't adopt a video because I don't think there's a single metric out there that speaks to 
video being a poor sales tactic or strategy or you shouldn't put up video. So if all these stats, because it's really not hard to find, a quick Google search will show you how video is more effective, it converts more, it, it engages more, there's more impressions, uh, there's more interaction, whatever your KPI, or your metric is, video does it at a bigger, better, to a greater extent than just text or whatever, or calling or email. Um, why would people not be adopting uh, video for sales if, it, if there's so many yeah. stats or data points that are sort of backing it up? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. So there's a couple major reasons that I see reservations around video. So one of the first biggest reservations that I hear is just kind of from a human element, that people are uncomfortable getting behind a camera, right? People feel like they're like, oh, I, you know, I'm worried about how I look. I'm worried about how I come across. And, and so I think there, and that's kind of goes back to what I was just saying about not needing to have any pedigree and about the authenticity. I always try to stress to people that you know, you're using this in a business context, not in a social context, right? Like this isn't dating, this isn't whatever. It's just about you getting across yourself and your personality. And you don't need to be hyper polished to do that, right? In fact, I think when you are going across and recording a personal video and, you know, say a friend walks by and you wave to them or something, I think that actually enhances it, right? Because yeah. it makes it feel like you're just a person. You're, you're like them. You're not like some distant thing. And so it's trying to get yourself, you know, I think one of the other things we realize with sales is we try to remove ourselves from it feeling like a sales interaction. You're a consultant, you're there to help them, you're there to provide value. And in my experience, the best salespeople are people that are genuinely there to provide value and to enhance the knowledge around something. And so, and so I think that again is part of the humanizing, you know, I, I think it's so easy in our modern society to forget that there's a human being on the other side of electronic response. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah. so I think that's, that's one thing it's, it's, it's doing. Another thing that I think is a common reservation is people basically say, yeah, this seems, this seems nice, but what about scalability, right? How, how is this yeah. going to scale? You know, what if I have, you know, you know, whatever someone might say, you know, I have a hundred inquiries coming in, like, how am I going to scale this up? And that's an interesting question because I have kind of two sides of how I view that question. So one side is to talk about, you know, hey, well, we integrate like this, so it makes it this much more turnkey. And, you know, we have features like roll up. So if you want to, you can send out 10 at once. And I'm tempted to kind of go down the route of directly explaining that. But I think that there's something I, I kind of when I start to go down that path, I also take a step back and I say, I believe very strongly in, in the concept of, you know, what we what some people I was watching a TED talk on this, they call it true fans. And basically the idea is say that every month you have one true fan and that one true fan just recruits one more true fan. And these people don't churn and they just keep expanding and adding new people. I think what you find is that by building one true fan, if you just do the math, right? You go two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, very quickly, you start to create this network of very loyal, high referring people. So suddenly what felt like it was very non-scalable you suddenly are taking a step back and saying, wow, I spent a minute and a half to send this video that's now responsible for, right? You do the math out, 5,000 of these yeah. relationships that comes down the line. And so I think that the more, in my eyes, kind of like honest answer to the scalability thing is when you start to build those, that kind of impact, then the business revenue that you should receive in return just means hire more people to send video. Right, like bring on a larger team. Like yes. that should be to me in a way how it scales. I think um, I think you made a very good point about uh, the true fan component, and I would take it a step further. I think that our obsession with uh, scalability, which really is just reaching out to massive amounts of people, throwing you know shit at a wall and hope that something sticks, is a testament to our inability to create authentic connections. And that's sort of, that's flowing up the entire, the entire sales chain. So if you don't train somebody how to build authentic connections or really target a proper persona, and you're just saying, go sell, then they're going to try and hit as many people as possible. And the second you have a component that is less, less automated and more, uh, more authentic, well, now, if you don't know who you're targeting, that's a very scary thing because you don't want to waste your time and your energy and your resources. But if you are, uh, if you do have that, and hopefully you do have the support of an organization that helps you find your proper buyer persona, helps you really know who you're targeting, and you're not just hitting, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand people a day and hoping that somebody comes back to you, 
um, then this isn't such a daunting technology anymore. Now, now it's just like a tool that sort of accentuates what you're already doing. But I think yeah. that a, a lot of organizations, I don't think that a lot of organizations know how to, to train sales people properly. I think that, uh, I think that a lot of organizations, especially smaller ones may not have the skill sets or the capability to map out a true persona. Um, and they're really just trying to, they're saying, you know, they're throwing a phone book at a sales rep and say, go sell. And if you don't give them the training, um, then what are they going to do? They're just going to try and hit as many people as possible. So I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. And it's been something that's been very imbued in my philosophy when I directed the sales team um, was just to really change. You know, I had my focus was very heavily around making my team the best experts in our yeah. industry as possible. I was like, I want our people to understand small business better than anyone else who's selling inbound marketing technology. And if we can do that, if we can have people on our team that are 10 X as knowledgeable, then we're going to win more accounts because we're adding more value in that interaction. So that that's hugely important. I think that's, I a hundred percent agree that one of the huge mistakes that I see is there's so much um, kind of people, so many people are trying to obsess about how many, how many touch points and how many this, 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 this. And it's not to say that you shouldn't have processes. I do believe that you do need to have processes in place, but I think that it can't come at, at the, um, you know, like you're saying, it can't come instead of really investing in and building the authentic relationships. And you get to that point where the volume becomes something that's suppressing that, then people, not only are they not generating results, but they're also burnt out. They're not excited. They're, you know, because yeah. that, that's the other thing that I think is really important is that salespeople by and large are very results driven. You know, that that's kind of how we're wired. It's like, you know, you, you want to get that commission, you want to get that, you know, successful result. And so, you know, going back to a tool like this, it's like, if you can show someone, Hey, hey use this and you're going to get 20% more results. Most salespeople are like, okay, <laughs> like, let's, I like the <laughs> exactly. Idea. Yeah, I think it's I think it's that intersection of process and and authenticity. That's where you will be the most successful at sales because you're right. You can't ignore process. You have to, you know. I'm a big fan of activity based sales management where you know uh, what you have to do, how many calls, how many emails you have to send, sort of like to, to get to the end result that you you want to achieve. But you have to do it purposefully, and you can't just do it ad hoc because if you're doing it ad hoc, I really do believe that you'll burn out. And this is a whole larger discussion than what we're talking about now. But, um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. It's important. It is very important. Um, so, so where are we now? So let's, let's just, uh, so anything else about like Bonjour, Bonjuro in, in particular that you wanted to bring up um, because while we're still sort of speaking about video and the company, um, usually before, uh, before I close these off, we can speak for a little bit, like sort of, pull out some life lessons that like sort of you've like you've learned over your career. So let's, let's sort of close off the, uh, the video piece and the Manjaro piece, but I want to sort of like yeah. give you the floor for, you know, future projects, you know, what you're excited about, where the company's going, or if there's even like, uh, some other, uh, talking points about video, go for it. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think that, I think that we honestly touched on a lot of the things that to me are kind of at the heart of, of kind of why I feel like video um, is interesting. You know, one other thing I'll just kind of note, um, Seth Godin, who is kind of like a marketing guru and someone who I find is a big inspiration for me, he, he wrote a book called Purple Cow. And in Purple Cow- I love Cow, Seth Godin, he, by the way. <laughs> he's one of my, yeah, he's one of my he's, favorite uh, marketers to listen to. Yeah, he's awesome. And you can just tell that he understands marketing in, in a way that's different. And, and in that book, what he talks about is he basically says, look, if you're driving down the road and you see a cow, you're, you're not going to think anything of it, right? That's a normal thing to see. But if you're driving down the road and you see a purple cow, that's going to be like, whoa, that's, that's different. And so I think that's the other kind of side of this, which is just that video, especially kind of this idea of like personal video in your inbox is very kind of different and it's very unique. And so one of the other things is we live in this age where people's inboxes are just crowded with newsletters and sales pitches and automation. And so part of what you're trying to do as a business when you're trying to connect with customers and get your message across is you're just trying to say, how can I be different? How can I do something that is going to make me kind of stand out? Um, and so I think that's, that's just one other kind of important component I would identify of, of, of why video, I think, is kind of seeing the traction that it's seeing um, as it grows as a space. And I think with, with all technologies that's, that have been proven out to be effective, 
um, eventually there will be a point where everybody is using them. So to use them now would be to get ahead of your competitors. Like to use video yeah. now, like, you, you know, there will be a point, I'm, I'm sure of it, where there will be no point in just text and video will be so accessible that uh, everybody's going to have their own YouTube channel. Everyone's going to build their own brand on all their social media. There's going to be tons of video. You're going to connect with, you know, your followers, your audience that way. Simultaneously, uh, messages are going to be predominantly video um, because it's, again, that's human, human, human interaction in your inbox. So you're not going to see so many text emails anymore. Like all these things are going to convert to what's the best way to be as authentic and engaged while still being, you know, remote and not in somebody's office. Um, I think, you know, like, uh, for example, with augmented reality, I do believe that like people are going to be working from home, but they're going to be able to literally see each other in the office um, yeah. and be and be chatting with each other. Like the, the ability to connect with humans um, is, is like people still need that human connection, but they, but now technology is enabling them to do it remotely. So totally. I think if you can get you can you can leverage both. You can leverage efficiency. You don't have to spend as much money on a on an on an office, or you don't have to you know go fly across the the country. But uh, if you're sending an email, like attach a video. If you're on a Zoom call, my God, just like go on video. If you're already in front of your computer, like the amount of times I see people that just don't go on video on Zoom calls, it's and it's 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 funny because I think that whenever I have a I don't know if it's a generational thing. It, it, I don't think it is entirely. But whenever I jump on a call with like a younger SaaS account executive, like video 10 out of 10 times. But if I'm going into different industries, then sometimes it's no video, just the name on a Zoom call, or whatever. And I, I just, I, I find it funny who, who looks towards new technologies and sort of who shies away from it is almost yeah, like an indication of, of the industry. <laughs> You're, you're totally right, man. And that landscape, I mean, just to give you an example, to use Bonjour as an example, Bonjour is headquartered in Australia, right? Yeah. I'm obviously in California. We have people in Texas. We have people in South Africa. We have people in the UK. You know, we're a global team. And because of technology, exactly what we're saying, things like Slack, things like Zoom, things like all these new technologies that allow us to still be able to interface, for me to be able to hop on with someone in one of the other departments and just have a quick conversation. This is kind of the new world that we're, we're kind of yeah. living and kind of thriving in. Um, but I still think even in that situation, that human contact, just like you were saying, I think is vital. It's super important. And so I, I think that technology is kind of facilitating, helping that connectedness. Yeah. Kind of I think happen. video is like the video is like the, that, that is the key until, in, until like we, we go to something else. Like video is still like that, that key to maintain that human connectivity like uh, in globally, right? Without uh, being in front of someone. Um, what, uh, where did I want to go? Okay, so I wanted to go over um, just some sort of life lessons, like you've been very successful in your career. Uh, I want to go over life lessons that you've kind of learned throughout your career. So uh, right. there's two questions I'd like to ask. Um, one, the first one is, if you were to tell your younger self, 20 year old, 18 year old, 16 year old self, uh, one thing, uh, what would it be? Um, I think that the, for the, the advice to my younger self is um, to almost even experiment more. You know, I think I ex experimented more than maybe some people, but I think that there's often this, um, I don't know if stigma is the right word, but like, for instance, I was into tabletop games and, and tabletop yeah. games is not a particularly glamorous or cool thing when you're, <laughs> you're going to college and you're kind of trying to fit in with the crowds, kind of nerdy. Um, but I think that there was so much value that I got from testing those out and from experimenting and doing those things, I think if I could go back, I would, I would worry even less about, uh, about, and I think this happens to a lot of us as we get older, we worry less about these yeah. things. Um, when you're younger, it's I think tough. I there's so much pressure. <laughs> it is, it is. Like there's so much of that kind of, and, and not only, not only from peers, but I think that there's this, you know, a lot of times families grow up and, you know, they're like, okay, you're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be, there's these very established, like these are the credible paths. And for people who are listening, who are interested in entrepreneurship, or even people, you know, even the word entrepreneurship, I find is very interesting because I think that the definition of it in many ways is changing, right? Like you can have someone who's a content creator, right? Who runs a podcast, who runs whatever. It's maybe not like their primary source of income, but they're yeah. still doing things that are entrepreneurial. So there's so many new abilities now for people to work on even projects right? It doesn't even have to be a full-time, full business anymore. This is 
the new world we live in, you know, someone actually was interviewing me yesterday about my growth with, with Arcom, a tabletop gaming company. And one of the things I was talking about was so interesting there is I was saying, you know, we now have democratization to capital through things like crowdfunding, like Kickstarter. Yeah. We have democratization to labor. I hired designers in Europe and South America and all over the world through things like Upwork and DeviantArt and all these others. And so, you know, the types of access that we have through technology has really opened up as well. Yeah, no, and I also think that if you aren't taking advantage of, again, definition of entrepreneur definitely has changed because, for example, I, I still, I'm still working. Like I, I'm running this podcast, something as, of a passion project because I like connecting with different marketing, sales, business leaders, and I think it provides value to people like me that are looking to understand uh, different facets of emerging uh, marketing, sales technology, and you know processes and strategies, whatnot. So that's why I'm putting this together and I get tons out of speaking with all these, you know, like yourself and other great individuals. I love it. You know, selfishly, I, I love having all these like one-on-one -on -one interviews with people from like uh, all these different types of industries, all doing different things. Um, but this is not like my nine to five. Maybe one day it will be. I have no idea. But uh, right now it's still something that I do for fun. But it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's something that I'm learning. It's something that I've learned and have hopefully done a, a relatively good job at and I'll continue to try and do better. Um, but if you're not, if you don't take advantage of all those extra resources, uh, you know, it's almost like you're, 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 you're selling yourself short and you're inhibiting your own professional growth in the career that you could be doing because everything that I learn in this, what in, in, you know, in like in building out and uh, recording video, editing video, editing audio, uh, publishing on social media, building out a social media following, like those are all things that are very, very obviously applicable to being a sales and marketing leader within an organization. And 100%. those are not all things that traditional organizations are that great at teaching you, right? Like sometimes you have to go out and learn some of that stuff on your own um, or learn how to be more effective because, you know, if you look at some organizations, there are individual influencers that are better at social media than Fortune 500, uh, Fortune 500 company. A hundred percent. And, and yeah. I think the other thing that's also so key is it's an investment in yourself. Right. Like yes. everything in life exists with an opportunity cost. And by you setting up a podcast and you buying the equipment and you getting all these different things and learning all those skills, you know, it's like you could take $10,000 and you yeah. could invest it in stocks. Right. But what is the learning? What is the growth? What is your actual increase in value as an individual because of that? Right. Much lower than if you invest in something like I'm going to build these relationships. I'm going to build these networks. I'm going to learn all of these different video oriented skills. And so to me, that's the other thing that, you know, I totally encourage, you know, all the people listening, whether they're going to start, you know, their own business or whether it's just starting a project is invest in yourself, invest in your own development. Because the, in my eyes, I've always felt that the actual paycheck is very, very small. I would rather in terms of importance to how much I've worked. And what I mean yeah. by that is I would much rather get in at a more entry level job that dramatically increase my value because then I'm, you know, I'm getting to say, take the reins of running a big social media for a company and I learn a ton. And then that becomes a stepping stone that dramatically increases my value versus that job that pays 30% more, but is dead end. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's a mindset that I, I encourage everyone that I chat with to say, really focus on what's moving you from a career standpoint and knowledge standpoint over the month. Very good. Very good. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I, uh, that's all I really have. I guess the last thing I wanted to, to ask you was, um, you mentioned, you mentioned Seth Godin as like a mentor or a source of, of knowledge that, uh, that you enjoy. And I, I love Seth too. Um, are there other like, uh, books, podcasts, audibles, things that you, uh, you know, a favorite, a favorite book or podcast, whatever that you'd recommend that you're reading now or that you've read in the past that, uh, that you've gotten a lot of insight from? Yeah, so I actually run a book review on my blog, oh, and I've reviewed okay, dozens. You're, <laughs> yeah. no, you're the perfect guy to ask then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I reviewed dozens and dozens of books, and for the very first time, I gave a book a ten out of ten. I haven't in two years given a single book a ten out of ten, and and that book was Fanocracy by David Scott, and I absolutely love this book. So basically, it studies a ton of different brands and how they basically create these very passionate fans and customer evangelists around their product. And it's fascinating because you would think like, okay, well, they're going to talk about Disney and Nike and whatever. 
one of the examples they use is like a classic car insurance company. Something that you wouldn't think would have like crazy fans, but they talk about how in a non-glamorous industry, this company has built, and it goes through the whole kind of game plan of how they've done it, these super strong referral, word of mouth, like telling everyone about how great this is. And I, I just love the way the book is presented because it's very actionable, um, but it really draws you in to the point where I found myself relating to the author so much and saying, like, yeah, man, like that, that's, that's how I feel. And so if there was one book that I would really recommend that I think is almost universally applicable to anyone who runs a business, because anyone who runs a, runs a business wants to have passionate people that support their business and brand, um, I would definitely give Fanocracy a read. Awesome, man. Okay. Um, that's all I got. How do people get in touch with you? Yeah. So um, the website, if people are looking to get in touch with Bonjoro, is just yeah. bonjoro.com. So B-O-N-J-O-R-O.com. Um, and if people are looking to get directly connected with me, they can always shoot me an email. So Casey, my name's C-A-S-E-Y, at bonjoro.com. People are always welcome to, uh, to reach out and shoot me any questions. Okay, cool. Is there anything else that I, that I missed or uh, are we good? No, that, that sounds great. Awesome, man. Okay, thank you, Casey. So um, I really, really appreciate the chat. Uh, so go, go reach out to uh, Casey. Go check out Bonjuro. I actually might check it out after, <laughs> after this call and see, if, uh, and see if I can run a trial uh, for my own team. So um, thank you again for listening to another episode of the Sales versus Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Scott. Uh, please, if you haven't already, like, uh, share, subscribe. You can find this podcast wherever you can download podcasts, uh, as well as on YouTube. And if you haven't already, um, please do share it with your friends, uh, peers, coworkers, family, anybody you think who could benefit from any sales, marketing, or business knowledge. Um, I hope you all have a, a very productive week, and we will speak again soon. Bye now.